Ramit Sethi is a New York Times best-selling author and founder of I Will Teach You To Be Rich. He went from being a college graduate who lost half of his money on his first stock market investment to becoming an expert in finance who has helped countless people get financially free. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Belief Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10, 10. Top 10. got my motivation high for my top 10, my top 10. gotta learn from the wise women and men, and men. all my life. Hey, it's Evan Carl Michael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person that you know, but you also know that you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Ramit Sethi, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Ignore the haters. I didn't ever start the site to generate revenue. So it was a blog. In fact, I didn't generate a cent of revenue for about three years. And I didn't put ads, I didn't do anything, because I didn't want people to think that this was some way for me to make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. I mean, the name of the site alone, right. it already kind of <laughs> makes you, like, who's yeah. this weird guy? <laughs> so eventually, um, about three years after starting it, I said, I wanna just try selling something on the site. I'd never sold anything online. And this was late 2006. Okay. So there weren't a lot of people selling a ton of stuff online, but I said, let me put together a small ebook. It was about 30 pages, and I sold it for $4.95. And I, I absolutely love this because, first of all, that number is so small. <laughs> and now, you know, we have courses that sell for over $12,000. Yeah. And, and yet, that $5 ebook was the most scared I've ever been about selling anything. <laughs> so I remember I'd been writing for free for three years, yeah. um, probably three to five times a week. I had a community that was really loyal. So these people were, there were like hundreds of comments on posts. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna post this. So I post <laughs> the ebook, it was a good ebook, and it was beautifully designed. And I was afraid that people would call me a sellout, mm -hmm. that people would say, oh, so this is a trick. You've just been building this up so you can sell. <laughs> and, and actually, that's exactly what happened. Um, I had people, and the comments are still live, you can go back and look at it, where people said, oh, I will teach me to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, so clearly you've jumped the shark. Yeah. All these horrible things. And as an entrepreneur, that really hits you in the gut mm -hmm. because I felt betrayed that I had been doing this for free for years, and I felt that um, people were questioning my ethics, that why would I play a three-year trick, right? And just all these, yeah. and also when you think about it, is selling really tricking someone? Right. No, I don't believe it is. But back then, I was scared to sell, I didn't think anyone would buy, I was selling from my heels, which means I was almost apologizing. Right. And so many entrepreneurs do that. Oh, I'm afraid, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna lower my price. Yeah. That'll make them love me. <laughs> and, and of course, all of those things were wrong. What stood out to me, though, was that while there were all these loud, vocal minority commenters who were worthless, they were never going to buy no matter what. Right there was a quiet group of people who were buying. And I could see the numbers. They were buying, they were sending me really positive emails, mm -hmm. they were opening my emails more, so I could see the math. And I was kind of confused. How come there's this loud vocal minority of complainers, and then there are these people who are actually loving it and saying, what's next? Right. So that's when I made the decision that I didn't understand what was going on, but there was something going on here. Yeah. And I want to figure it out. And over the next three years, I dive deep into the psychology of selling, um, into how to create world-class products, pricing, basically how to create value that people are so happy to pay that price is a mere triviality. Rule number two, create the ladder of personal finance. What's a few simple things that they should be doing right now to have a checklist to do before the end of the year to then crush for a whole 12 months moving forward. All right, I'm gonna give you something called the ladder of personal finance, which tells you where your money should go. Okay, this is just step by step, put your money here, and if you wanna know all the details about it, you can check out the system. So it's in the book too? The, the, it's yeah. in great detail in the book. Got it. All right, so 
If you've got some money lying around, what should you do with it? First of all, if you've got a 401k match at work, you should max that out. That's free money, take advantage of it. And if you're not sure what that means, go to your HR person and say, does this company match any 401k contributions? If they say yes, do what I said. Uh, next, if you've got debt, pay it off. Pay it off aggressively. You know, what's interesting is that most people in debt who I talk to don't actually know how much they owe. And that's shocking. Mm. You would think, of course they would know. No, they don't. Because who wants to proactively- Stare at their debt all day. Yeah, and just feel <laughs> bad about it. Yeah. But you know what? You feel much better when you have a plan. Mm. And the number one question I ask folks uh, when they tell me they have debt, I say, number one, do you know how much you owe? They never do. Number two, for the rare people who say, you know, 15,000 or 70,000, whatever, I say, what is your debt payoff date? You can Ooh. actually plug it in. You can pay, uh, plug in a debt payoff calculator online. You can map it all out and you will be able to know the exact month your debt will be paid off. Based on how much you're spending right now. On Based it. on how much you're contributing to that debt payoff. Now, you will be able to see that if you add an extra 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month, that thing will actually oftentimes shorten by years because of the interest. It doesn't matter if it's gonna take you three months or four years to pay off your debt. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that you know the date. Okay, so that's number two, pay off any debt you've got. Three, if you've got money left over, uh, go to your Roth IRA. And if you can, max that out. That's a great tax advantage to count. It grows it. tax deferred, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, so that's three. That's three. Okay. It's actually post-tax money. And then four, if you still got money, you're going to go to back to your 401k, which is uh, another tax advantaged account. You're going to max that out. If you still got money, you're going to create a non-taxable, non-retirement account and just put your money in there. Now, there's a few other wrinkles to this. There's HSAs available. There's also your emergency fund that's talked about in the book and all these things are details. But that just shows you when you've got money, this is where you go. There's a structured way of thinking about it. A ladder towards a ladder. financial success. Exactly, and if you follow the steps, it's almost like, the, like a waterfall. It just goes from step one to step two to step three, and your money's going where it needs to go automatically, and you will feel great. You'll feel great, which is so important, and also you're gonna look at your accounts and see debt's going down. Investment and savings are going up, and all of a sudden, you wake up six months from now, and you're like, oh my God. I didn't realize I have that much saved in my savings account. That's because of the decision you made today. Mm. Rule number three, don't be vanilla. After running this business for 12 years, I think I learned, I think my beliefs changed. Um, I believe now that the world will always try to get you to be vanilla. The world wants you to do everything like them. They want you to lower your prices. The world will pull you down. Uh, they want you to make your website look like everybody else's, easy, fast, secure. And the minute you do it, they abandon you. The world wants you to look exactly like it, and the minute you do it, they will abandon you. Rule number four, focus on what you can control. I think that there are definitely um, systemic problems when it comes to things like inequality, when I think it comes to things like student loan debt, yes. Those are problems and there needs to be a lot of work done on those. And we can simply look at history to see how uh, crazy tax rates are compared to where they've been historically or how crazy student loan debt is compared to where it was historically. But whenever I hear someone who starts complaining about the, uh, large scale societal problems, I just have one question. I say, do you invest in your 401k? And it's one thing to talk about systemic problems and we should talk about them and tackle them. But the best thing we can do for ourselves is to focus on what we can control. And that's what I believe. That's why I'm here. Some people work on systemic problems. I'm here to help people one-on-one -on -one with their money and their psychology. Yeah, that, that to me is a, a very interesting and powerful approach. I come at it the same way. I was giving a talk at Google and there was an African-American gentleman in the front row and basically the question was like, is it harder for me? And my answer was, yes, that seems pretty apparent, but now what? Mm. So you can go try to tackle that systemic problem and I'm super glad that there are people who are wired for that. Yeah. But for me, I'm always like, what can I do right now today? Because when you're dealing with huge systemic problems, you're basically you're doing something amazingly altruistic for the next generation, but the odds of you being able to reap the benefits of that are pretty slim. Yeah, yeah, so, I agree. And, and I think that when you can start to take control and make one step after another, for example, for people who are in debt, it's so interesting. When people write me about how to get out of debt, over 90% of them don't know how much they owe. Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't ha- know how much you owe, I understand that. Why would you want to open up the emails and the bills? It's, you don't know what's inside, but you know it's bad. But the first step to doing that, to paying it off, is to open it up, confront reality, mm. get real, and then make a plan. And all of those things can be done in and of yourself without regards to what's going on outside your house or outside your email inbox. Also, if you want to have unstoppable confidence and self-love, check out my 254 series. They're free. The links to join are in the description below. One of the real reasons we don't do the things that frighten us is because we are afraid of being judged. I think doubt is one of the greatest enemies of our lives. I want you to write five questions down that you're going to ask yourself three or four times a day. Five questions that are positive for yourself. Rule number five, learn what you can do with money. In college, you get interested in finance. How did you start getting that interest? Uh, another, um, another accident, which was I took that first scholarship I got and I invested it in the stock market. <laughs> so they had written the check to me. This is 1999, 2000. I take that money. I think I know what investing is, which I don't. <laughs> and I lose half of that immediately. That's not a good thing to do with your college scholarship <laughs> money. So I was like, oh, man. And I started studying personal finance. Now, finance and personal finance, very different things. Mm. If we look outside the street, we see investment bankers, they have nothing to do with money that you and I operate with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So I started reading and I saw all these experts saying these, these old chestnuts we've heard over and over. Keep a budget, don't spend money on lattes, Never go on, the, never do anything with your money. Just sit at home like a hermit. Yeah. And at the same time, I was studying human psychology. Um, I was studying persuasion. I was studying all these mm-hmm. facets of human behavior at Stanford. And I just realized, like that book, The Emperor Has No Clothes, I realized that all this expert advice didn't actually work. Mm-hmm. So when people say keep a budget, great in theory, nobody keeps a budget. When people say don't spend money on lattes, great in theory, nobody listens to it. In fact, I don't even want to listen to it. <laughs> like I go out, I want to go out, I want to buy a round of drinks for my friends. I want to be able to go in a taxi if it's really hot outside or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And the experts spent the last 50 years telling us all the things we can't do with our money. And so I started developing a philosophy of what you can do and living a rich life. And that doesn't mean putting it all in a savings account and just counting your pennies every day. I think it actually means living life. Rule number six, be patient. Sometimes I learned that people just aren't ready to buy and that's just the way it goes. Um, Like we had people that have been on our list for six years. They've seen some of these products be launched like seven, 14 times. And then one day they'll just buy randomly. And I see it come across my dashboard. I'm like, what is this? So I'll email them. Hey, notice you've you know, joined finally after seven years. What's up? And they're like, they'll tell us the most interesting things. They'll be like, oh, well, uh, I tried to do it on my own. It didn't work, so I'm finally ready. Or, oh, I paid off my debt or, or just because. And so my key lesson from that was just to be patient. If you've put the right process into place, if you've selected the right customers, if you've built the best products, you have the best marketing, our philosophy is it's just a matter of time. Rule number seven, avoid negative people. So we grow up with these things I call invisible scripts. And these are the scripts that are beliefs that are so powerful, we don't even realize that they're, they're around us. That's why they're invisible. So a classic one in America is the American dream is buying a house. Where did that come from? And in fact, there's all these phrases that people use like, uh, you're throwing money away on rent. They don't make more land, you know, and on, on, and on. If you really deconstruct that and you actually run the numbers, you might discover that actually buying a house is often not the best investment. And this is super counterintuitive. People get really mad because real estate is religion in America. But if you actually dive in deep, you might discover, wow, there's a lot of parties who want me to spend a ton of money. That's why, for example, I could buy today, but I rent. Mm. And when people hear that, they're like, wait, I thought the I will teach you to be rich guys, rich, so why is he renting? They get very confused because real estate is religion. You know, another thing that is um, really common today for people is there's no way to get ahead, right? Especially for young people. Social security won't be around, et cetera, et cetera. And I just don't believe in that. I think if you go onto Reddit or you go onto these places where it's a, it's a lot of people who are um, disaffected young people, they create an echo chamber mm. of other people who want to victimize themselves, 
then you have a choice. Do you wanna be reading those threads? Or, like I was reading the comments on your YouTube videos. I was like, these are the best YouTube comments I've ever seen. People are positive, constructive. They're pointing out things they saw in the 30 second minute of the video, meaning they actually watched the whole thing. Those are the kind of people that I want people to be mm. around. So it's not impossible to make money. There's actually a lot of people making money. It's not impossible to get ahead, pay off debt, even invest and grow. There's a lot of people doing it. But if you're surrounded by people who constantly complain about how difficult it is and it's impossible, guess what? You're gonna absorb those invisible scripts. Rule number eight, don't brag around. You will notice that a lot of these online entrepreneurs, what do they tend to brag about? Have you noticed? Um, number one, how much money they make. Yes, number how two, many subscribers. How many subscribers? And number three, how big their team is. Have you ever noticed oh. that? And also number four, how little they work. Oh, I make a million dollars, I only work two days a year. Yeah, okay, a break. <laughs> go F yourself. So, so you'll notice it. that we don't brag about how much money we make. We've mentioned a couple of times some remarkable results that we've generated, but we don't go around bragging about how much money we make. We don't brag about how many people we have. We don't brag about how little we work. I work a lot, yeah. and so does our team, and we love it. I would rather spend our time bragging about our students' results. And that's why you see us putting them front mm -hmm. and center. We put their photos, we put their full links to their websites, mm -hmm. we fly them into New York and do full case studies with them. Very yeah. expensive, but it's the right thing to do. I'd rather talk about how we took ordinary people, like the people watching, and helped them build massively successful businesses, or learn how to cook, or lose weight, whatever. Yeah. I'd rather talk about that than, oh, look how many people I have, and look at our budgets, and da da da. Rule number nine, focus on the big wins. How does one become rich in an environment where there's 2% you know, treasury rates and unemployment is high, it's difficult to get a job for a young person? How do you do that? You know, I think there's a few ways of looking at it. And the first thing I would consider, especially based on psychology, is to focus on the big wins, right? So the latte example is bad advice because one, it doesn't work, and two, it's minutia. Saving two or three dollars a day doesn't really do anything in the grand scheme of things, and it makes us feel guilty. Right? Instead, if we get these five or 10 big wins right, we never have to worry about lattes or the size of our Diet Coke ever again. For example, starting to invest early, getting your asset allocation right, not buying real estate simply because you think it's the best investment, like so many people believe. If you get these five or 10 big wins right, negotiating your salary, et cetera, you never have to worry about the little things. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is aim to be the best. There is room in the market for the best. The, the things that we do in product development and growth and customer service and all the groups that we have, it's about craftsmanship. It's about spending whatever it takes to build the best product. Um, we do test, we do A-B test, we do all of that. But taking the time, because when we launch something, we know that it has to be the best. That's how we honor the students who joined our programs. Um, there's room in the market for the best. Don't ever let the market pull you down. You should pull the market up with you. Now I've got a special bonus tip from Ramit on how to adjust your belief system that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know who are the negative people in your life that you need to start avoiding? Let me know, put it down in the comments below. And if you made it this far in a video, you're still here watching, give me a hashtag believe down in the comments below. I wanna celebrate you. We don't just watch videos here, we do something about it. So give me that believe in the comments below too. If you take somebody and you just talk, I, I do this a lot. They'll be at one of my talks or they are on my newsletter or following me on Instagram. And uh, I'll give you an amazing example that just happened recently. I had a woman who wrote me and she said, Ramit, can you help me convince my husband not to waste money? And I go, okay, what, what's going on? She goes, he spends so much money on iced tea. And I was like, here we go. <laughs> I go, how much money? And she goes, he buys iced tea 20 times a month, like almost every day. I said, how much is this iced tea? And she said, it's $1.50 each time. So in my head, I'm like, this is insane. Like, why are we even talking about this? Right. But I knew there's something here, so I wanna unpack it. I said, out of curiosity, what's your household income? No response for 20 minutes, okay? And then finally she comes back, she goes, I'm not comfortable sharing that. So I said, just give me a range. Okay, what do you think her, her and her husband's household income is? I know the story. I, I would have guessed otherwise. 80,000, 100,000. Like a nice like 600,000. And the, 
This is a perfect example. Like rationally and logically, we should literally not be talking about this because it's a rounding error. But there's something going on in her belief system mm. that made her fixate on iced tea. And so for anybody, whether it's iced tea or whether it's, you know, lattes is a classic example. Everybody tells you not to spend money. I'm like, that's the worst advice ever. Buy as many lattes as you want. <laughs> or some people, they just love, for example, clothes, mm. right? I like clothes. They love it, but everybody around them has told them things like, that's shallow, that's a waste of money. You should invest in your Roth IRA. And so what do they do? All of us, we're torn apart because we live in a paradoxical society that is both puritanical, telling us we should retreat into a cave and do nothing, but then we go on Instagram and everyone's in Bora Bora <laughs> wearing, it's ridiculous. And so what do we do? We just buy everything and then we feel guilty. It's the worst possible response. So what I do is first I say, what do you love spending money on? Mm. Love. And nobody talks about this. They always say, oh, let me see your budget. You're overspending. And everyone's just like, ah, forget this. Right? I'll never come on here and berate someone for their spending because I've seen it all. When they talk about what they love, then I say, what would it feel like to be able to spend two times or four times as much on that? Mm. And people have never thought like that. Then, once we start from a place of aspiration of what do we want, let's work through the mechanics of how to get there. If you want to see the top 10 I did on Dan Locke, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. What is the difference between a high income job versus a high income skill? Knowing the answer to this question will have a significant impact.